Hello, Shayla. Welcome to Confidence Conversations. Hey, how are you? I am so good and I'm better now that you are here to talk with us though. Thank you for having me. It is an honor to be here. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. Yes, it is a moment to not just survive, but to thrive and (laughs) to build on that, right? I want to dive in and just really know what confidence means to you. Uh, Confidence to me means uh, showing up when you don't want to, bringing your absolute best to the forefront and no matter what, letting your light shine. Yeah, it's so important. I think a lot of times people confuse confidence with never being afraid or just always being ready to go and in the mood. And it's like, no one is ever perfect. And feeling that way would imply that we're perfect. So I totally agree with your example that confidence really is showing up and doing the things that scare you, despite the fact that you're not over the fear and just kind of working through that. And I know you know a lot about working through fear, working through obstacles as an entrepreneur. So I want to get to the bottom of your entrepreneur journey because I know that you've had a lot of different phases and stages. Yes, yes, I have. I, um, I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years. I founded, I guess, my first two businesses. I was a fashion stylist and then I founded my coaching and consulting business back in 2011. Um, so 10 years later, I sunset my styling business in 2016. Look, this is a condensed version. Uh, sunset in 2016 after I got married, um, just kind of felt like God was leading me in a different direction and I didn't know where yet. So I just focused on my coaching and later on that year, um, Black Girls Wine came to me. Um, and it was almost like, I always tell people like it definitely was God sent because I come from a family that we don't even have alcohol on the holidays. Like it was definitely oh, like, wow. Uh, yeah, my, our, our house was dry. So <laughs> I feel like when God had sent me black girls wine, it was just kind of like, okay, so this is something you want me to build something with. Like this is the legacy part mm-hmm. of this entrepreneur journey because it's so much bigger than just me. It's so much bigger than what I'm doing. And then in building Black Girls Wine, it actually gave me a different perspective in how I um, execute on my coaching business and work with my clients. Because now I think about it as I'm not just, this isn't just my legacy. I'm affecting the legacy of other households. And that is what keeps me motivated, even when it gets Uh tough. Yeah. So I know that you, your business is kind of like Black Girls Magic meets wine in a luxury experience. So I want to know all about the birth of that idea. You said that God gave you the idea, but I want to know how you knew. We talked about this before, and I think it's so crazy when entrepreneurs get these ideas where you're like, really? That for me? So I want to know about that moment and how you really kind of took, like, hit the ground running and decided, okay, I'm going to go with this. Yeah, so I am definitely somebody who's like a marinator. Like I let things, I will let it sit until I know that it's time. If it's not time, I'm not moving on it. So when I first launched Black Girls Lime in 2016, you know, when you launch a business, everybody has so many ideas and opinions for you. Like everybody wants to, you should do this with it. You should do that with it. And it was just kind of like, well, yes, that's an option. But what I'm looking to do is a little bit more than that. I knew that I wanted to create a space where Black women could show up together and to be able to also curate luxury experiences for them. Um, I didn't know how it was going to happen initially, but I could feel the wheels turning in my head. And so in 2019, I left my job and I left with complete faith that God was going to tell me what to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, about stepping out on faith. <laughs> yes, I love my job. It was very scary. And the, the thing is, I should say that that was my second time leaving my job. That wasn't my first time quitting corporate to, to um, try and build a business. So, you know, round two, you're a little bit more cautious. <clears throat> my husband was like very encouraging. He told me for longer, long before I quit, like you can quit. It's okay. Just do it. And it was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to do it. But I can honestly say everything, timing is everything. And I think I quit when I was supposed to. 
um, and just the way things kind of align and the amazing women who have been following me for three years online, um, they were already a part of my community. We're really excited about the idea. And <clears throat> it is, the idea is continually validated by how many people want to be a part of it. Um, and so this year I have shifted my focus to really level us up in the luxury space and to only offer luxury offers, which is scary too. That. Like we're transitioning now to a 100% luxury model and very country club style. This is what you get. This is a part of your membership. Um, and it's scary. I think what you said is true. Like, I don't think that you ever, the fear never goes away. It's what keeps you humble. It's what keeps you, yeah. human, right? It's what keeps that humanistic part of like building a business and being able to relate to other people because this is just scary every day. <laughs> yeah. It is. And it's one of those things too, where as a leader of your business, having maybe one to five, especially like team members where you're, you are really small, maybe you're doing this on your own. You have to make those decisions. And it's great that you have a supportive husband that's there to kind of bounce ideas off of, or at least just support you. But it is a lot of pressure or seemingly pressure when you're like, I have to decide this and this decision, whatever I choose is going to not, I don't want to sound as dire as like, it's going to make or break, but it really will determine the track. It determines the, a lot. Yeah. I want to kind of go backwards a little bit and talk about that quitting moment, because I think that people, there, there's almost this feeling that you like know that the timing is right. Or like you feel like all of your ducks are in a row and I can like test, like provide my own testimony that that is completely not the case, but I want to hear about your experience because it sounds like you were a little hesitant to make the move. And it was him who really was like, I was. <laughs> I was. The first time I quit my job was in 2014 and that was to build my styling business and my coaching business. Right. And I feel like I wasn't afraid that time. And during my time out of corporate, I learned a lot. I taught myself how to build websites. I I figured out where my fashion degree came into play because I have a great eye for graphic design. I do my yeah. own graphics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so that was my degree at work. <laughs> and look, shout out to my dad. who's was like, what was that degree in again? Right? <laughs> um, so that's where that degree came in. Um, but really being able to see it at work and then going back to corporate because I wasn't, I wasn't as... Uh, I don't know what the word is. I needed that experience to be mm -hmm. able to do it in 2019 though. Yeah. And so when I did it in 2019, my apprehension came from one, I was married and it was like, okay, this isn't the same. Like if I was single, I would just go home with my parents and I would be worried. But I was like, now I have a whole other person along on this journey. And funny thing is my husband and I were together when I quit the first time. So it's like, I'm about to take him through this a second time. Only this time it's up close and personal because we're married and he's here. And so I was also apprehensive because the idea for Black Girls Wine Society was still kind of in the back of my mind. Like it was still kind of like a, okay, this is how, this is an idea, but I hadn't fully fleshed it out yet. And I feel like every time I got ready to leave corporate, something always happened that would push me out the door. And for me, it was, I got a scholarship to go to Batonage Forum in uh, Napa. And I, Put in I bought my plane ticket and everything you know that meme that's like black people they they buy the plane tickets then put their time off in that was me right uh, so <laughs> I bought my plane ticket and then I told my manager like hey I need this time off and when I submitted it she called me in her office and she was like oh well we can't give it to you and I'm like why not and she was like oh well we don't have enough coverage mm. I told myself that sounds like a you problem I ain't got nothing to do with my vacation so I called my husband immediately like, okay, so I think it's time to quit my job. And I told him what happened. And he was like, put that two weeks in. I've been telling you to quit since March, and I was like, since January. And I was just like, Ugh. so this was April, 2019. And I wasn't planning on leaving until like July or August because my goal, I had like a savings goal in mind. Right. But at the time it was like, either you take this scholarship and you take this opportunity and you go or you stay stuck here yeah. and, and so I I that because we often think that it, it's going to be an easy thing but sometimes you get pushed into your journey or pushed into your destiny and you have to make 
a crucial decision in the moment. And it's like, all right, either I'm going to really pursue this thing or it's going to be something that's just on the back burner for however long. And it's going to bug me that I didn't act on it. And I'm potentially going to see somebody else doing it or I can go out there and just do it for myself. So I love that you actually took the chance on yourself and invested and bet on yourself because that's that's the key thing. And it's not an, a situation where you had all of these things lined up or your savings was where you thought it would be. But oftentimes your calling will be louder than any of your circumstances and you kind of just have to pursue it. So I know that a lot of the listeners have probably heard of Black Girls Wine, but others have not. So tell me all about the experience that you offer. Yeah, so Black Girls Wine is a lifestyle brand. When I founded it in 2016, I wanted it to be the Nike of the wine industry, right? So this is the brand that all the Black women know and love when it comes to exploring wine, um, trying new wines, connecting with other Black wine lovers. And the Black Girls Wine Society is kind of like going to the Nike fitness class, right? So this is the experience part of it. And so with Black Girls Wine Society, we offer um, monthly experiences to our members across the country and around the world. Um, Last year, we pivoted and we added virtual membership. And we also have two virtual chapters. We have a running calendar of national events that any of our members can attend. Um, And then our virtual chapters have their own virtual events, as well as all of our chapters across the country. So we've got 50 plus chapters and we have Nash, like we have anniversary week, which is really huge. Um, This year, we're having a really fun experience. I can't announce it yet. We're really fun. I'm so Uh, excited. (laughs) I'm like super stoked about it. It's going to be amazing. Um, And then hopefully next year when outside opens back up, we can actually go back outside um, because we've got Got some serious plans and some great partners coming on board who want to help like really create these experiences for black women and make this magic come true so i'm really excited we are focused on celebrating sisterhood helping black women explore on their wine journey and also building connection and legacy for black women in the luxury space i love that it's really needed and necessary. I think that oftentimes our experiences are othered or, you know, you get the, and I, I love Tyler Perry, so there's no disrespect to him, but the, like the Tyler Perry version of the experience where it's like the, you, you know, the, the stereotype, but this is really bringing Black women and Black experiences to the mainstream. And it's just saying that we like luxury too. We do nice things as well. Let's normalize that because yeah. it is normal and let's bring it to the forefront. So I know running a business with 50 national chapters, having your hand in so many different buckets at one time, it's got to be hard to find a sense of balance, especially business owner, wife, you're doing it all. So how do you balance or even just juggle everything that you go through? And what tips do you have for people who are looking to find more balance in their lives? Oh, Uh, I would say my biggest tip is just being intentional about doing what you need to do for you. Um, We all have like different needs. We all have different things that work for us um, and that really help ground us. Um, And so I would say you have to be intentional, especially, you know, you get to a phase in business. I am not at the phase where I'm just coasting and everything's great and I'm debt free and I'm not there yet even, you know, and, and this, our recent pivot is so that this company can grow and actually be a flourishing business. Um, And so it's, it's a, it's a beautiful time and experience, but it's also really crunch time. So it can be stressful. And so for me, it's about being intentional about making sure I get that time with my husband, making sure I get that time for myself. Like, When it's cold here, I live in Virginia, so we have all four seasons. When it's cold and I can't get to the beach, then I'll go to Target or Home Goods, right? Like for me, that's my reset. I don't even have to be spending money. I could just be going and looking at beautiful things. And it's the beautiful things that really helps revive my spirit. Or I'll go over to our Saks, um, go to our Louis Vuitton, go to our, you know, and just to be able to look around and experience the luxury, experience the beautiful things, even if I'm not spending money. Um, but it helps to recharge me and that's what you have to do, right? So do 
keeping those things on the forefront that help recharge you because otherwise you do get lost in the work it's easy you know as an entrepreneur it's yeah. easy to like work into midnight barely get any sleep get up the next day you know and so you gotta keep top of mind like all right this is what i need to do for me yeah, it's so true. We get so caught up in the to-do list and all the things that we have that that we, we quite frankly, we do need to do, but we get caught up in that rather than let's refuel the engine that's actually executing on all of this. And if I'm not where I need to be mentally, physically, emotionally, I can't actually do a good job for my business. And so I think that people think of, you know, self-care or taking a break or doing whatever feels right for you in the moment as this kind of uh, a luxury or an added benefit when really it's just, it's a necessary part of life if you want to actually be living life to the fullest and also thriving in whatever it is that you're doing because you, you can't thrive if you're not well rested if your brain cannot think and so you kind of touched on it but i, I want to turn and really get your idea of um what self-care is and like what that means to you for me you know what's funny is that i feel like my self-care journey especially in the last year has really been all about like rediscovering things that help me grow and make me happy like i I've always been a nerd. Like I've always been in the, the, you know, accelerated classes. I went to a governor school and I feel like as an adult, sometimes our careers and our businesses and things, they, they will take us off that path of like, oh, this is what you used to really enjoy doing. And so for me, honestly, self-care has really been kind of reading more to make myself better and I've really been enjoying that so I recently finished reading The Big Leap um by Gay Hendricks it's a life-changing book oh I I'm actually add that to my list The Big Leap The Big Leap um one thing that I am going to be diligently working on because I think I have like an hour left on Audible um is my next book is High Performance Habits um I really want to be a high performer. So the author who wrote that, I think it's Brendan Bruchard. The author who wrote that has coached Oprah. He's coached Usher. He's coached so many high performers. And the thing is like being a high performer is important to me in itself here because if I am performing at my best, then that means I'm going to show up and get to experience my life in the best way possible. And it really is about like that high performance isn't just, oh, I can do this in X amount of minutes. It's about you know what, did I get the eight hours of rest that I needed so that my brain can be fully charged and I can show up and be bright and excellent, right? And yeah. even when it comes to, um, ex you know, experiencing my family or being ha happy because I got a good night's sleep so that I can play with my dog. Like, and so for me, that self-care has really been about like taking care of Shayla and who she is and who she wants to become. So that's kind of, that has been my self-care journey over the last year. I like really love that. On that. And fellow nerds unite. I, I love it. I'm always reading. I used to, okay, so this is super embarrassing, but I'll admit it to you. I used to like have a little classroom in my basement of like no students where I would be teaching and like reading books. So I love that <laughs> your go-to is reading. This was back when I was a kid. I love it. I now. Um, but one of the things that I loved that you mentioned was being able to go back and look at all of the things that you used to love doing and reevaluating, you know, why am I maybe not engaging in those things right now and how can I get back to the core? And it kind of also builds on what you mentioned earlier about, I have these degrees and these certificates and things that I've learned that Honestly, I wasn't sure how I use them, but then they all come together. And I think that that's the really beautiful thing about just living in flow and kind of letting life happen after you're able to take a moment and step back and engage in self-care. All of the pieces kind of fall into place for you and you really don't have to do much. Like you were able to say, okay, there's my fashion degree at work. And it, it's funny, right? How that stuff translates because it'll be in the least likely or least expected things. Like I um, have spent a lot of time in the corporate world, 
um, did a lot of like boot camps and stuff like that. And the lessons that I've learned there, like the exercises that I would walk um, my business clients through or pharmaceutical companies through, they're the same strategies that I'm employing in my own business or that I'm, you know, using that frame of mind to go evaluate things that I'm doing. So every part of life is a lesson if you let it be. Absolutely. So I want to know what's one of your favorite life lessons that's kind of stuck with you over the years? Uh, <laughs> probably uh, something I always say. I say this is like my personal quote. Like when I die, this will be the quote that people know that I've always said. is <laughs> uh, Feel the fear and just do it anyway. I and love that. That is my, I say that all the time because I... People will say to me, especially like looking at Black Girls Wine and the society and everything that I've been able to grow. And they're like, oh, you're so courageous. Like, you're so brave. And I'm like, I don't think I'm brave. I think that I felt the fear and I just did it anyway. I did it scared. Um, every business move I've ever made, you know, you just do it scared. And, and doing it scared, you're able to beat the fear. That's what makes you courageous. Not because you did it, but because you beat it. Yes, that is so key. I just want to like sit and let that soak in because it, it's so true, right? Like we think like all of these thoughts, what if it doesn't work out? What if this was a better option? We, it, it's like all of these things, especially when you're coming time to make a crucial decision, that's where doubt seems to creep in the most. And just having that confidence to know like that you've made the right decision, that you are on the right track and kind of just stand in your proof is so crucial. And so you talk about doing it afraid, but I know that some people are like that fear is paralyzing and it's preventing them from going forward. So what recommendations do you give to, you know, prospective entrepreneurs or people who are looking to, you know, engage upon this new life? What advice do you have for doing it afraid? A question that I will challenge you to ask yourself is if this never happens, what is that going to feel like for me? Because a lot of times we're like, oh my God, I'm scared to do it. I'm scared to launch this business. But if you never launch that business, will you continue to live paycheck to paycheck? If you never take the leap, if you never ask for the raise, if you never, if you never step out and, and take the chance, your life remains the same. And if right. you are okay with your life remaining the same, because it's just that great, then you don't have to feel the fear and do it anyway. But if at any point, you have not been happy with where you are, you have to look at the consequences of what it will feel like for you to stay exactly where you are. Are you gonna be disappointed in yourself? Are you gonna feel sad that you see all these other people living their dreams and you didn't? One thing that you hear a lot of um, successful entrepreneurs, influencers say is that I wish I had started taking it more serious sooner. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody says. Yeah. And it's because you really do. Like a lot of times you feel it, you've got that idea. You know, imagine if I had quit my job in January when my husband told me to how much further along the society would be, right? Like for it to not have launched until August. Like, and so you have to think about that. Like, how is it going to feel if you don't do it? Yeah, that's so true. And I think back to when my, what's now a consulting business, Fireside Insights was just a blog. And I love, I just wanted to go out there and tell stories, right? Tell people how to get interviews and how to be entrepreneurs. Like, I love that. I ate it up. And there was always something in the back of my mind being like, this is a business. You have to go and do this as a business. And I was like, this isn't a business. How am I going to make money off of this? This is a blog. And I didn't do, and I didn't do anything. And I look back and just see all of the things that I've done. And when I actually quit my job, how I was able to just pull from the stuff that I'd done years ago. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this really was a business all along. I could have started so much longer ago. I could, I should have stuck with it and been just like tenacious over time. And where would I be? Who knows? But we, we can't get, you know, bogged down in those thoughts, but just knowing that like the steps you're taking now are getting you to where you want to be. And I think that people expect to like plant a seed and see a flower the next day, but y'all know that's not how gardening works. You and plant it changes. Yeah. It changes. I'm not seeing the <laughs> 
<laughs> it's in the ground. You don't see it. It's in the dark. And but it flourishes over time, right? Mm-hmm. And your vision can change the way that tree, that flower, like blooms. It changes, and that's okay too. Like you're allowed to change course and change track. But I think that staying stagnant in a place where you are feeling that you can and should be doing more that is such. A, I don't want to say dangerous and make it sound like this do or die thing, but it, it's you live a life unfulfilled when you do that. You really do. And I think it's the big leap touches on quite a few things. And I think that's what made has made that book so pivotal for me in this season. So for people who have like maybe been following my personal account for a while, they'll know like I was doing coaching and I had like a program going in everything just last year. And I had stopped it so that I could focus on Black Girls Wine. But one thing that Big Leap does talk about and touch on um, is operating in your genius zone. And I know for me, like business strategy is my genius zone. That's how I built Black Girls Wine Society. I've used the strategies that I've taught other people over and over again to build this business. And it's, it, it all starts like small as an idea. When I started Black Girls Wine Society, it was small, right? I'm reopening up my coaching books and I'm just doing VIP days now, right? Like, so it starts small. I would have never thought to do a group coaching VIP day last year, never. I would have been scared to like, well, who's gonna like book it? Who's gonna wanna do it? Like, and, and part of it, having that anxiety about it, but the seeds that I've been planting over time are now flourishing. Now they're starting to grow. I'm seeing like something out of the ground is coming up. It's not a full tree yet or a full, you know, rose bush, but it's it's starting to grow. And as it grows, I think the beauty is in the journey. It's not gonna look the same year one as it will year five, right? And it's interesting to see all those seeds coming to life And it really is encouraging. So I just will say, like, if you're watching or listening, look, take me and Jocelyn as an example. Plant your seeds. Just do it. Just do it. Keep watering them. Like, plant them. Let them grow. Um, It's such a beautiful thing to see. And I, I love that idea of operating in your genius zone. I think that your purpose is really where, you know, what you do well and what you love doing meets other people's needs and so finding that like really really sweet spot of like okay this is what I actually enjoy doing and this is what people need and I like meeting that need and I think that that's where a lot of times we have troubles we're thinking that I'm good at this but no one's going to want that or I'm good at this but I don't know how to operationalize it as a business and it's really just building off of that idea one moment at a time. It's kind of like the blog that I mentioned. It's like, you don't have to have this whole vision of how things are going to to come to terms and go and build this big tree, this big idea. You really just have to know what it is that you like doing and stay at it because those ideas, those opportunities, when I say they come to you, it sounds like woo woo and like booga booga. It, they, they come to you. They do they come really to you. Do. And you don't have to do anything and I I would remember moments I have these moments like every week where I will literally pop up from wherever I am like if I'm taking a break or like I have a tv day or like a reading day and I'll pop up like oh my god I have to write that down because I they they come to you and you don't have to do anything outside of being intentional about what it is that you are doing and being resilient and staying on it like have that pattern, have that repetition, have your daily habits and goals, do that part. All the rest just kind of falls in line. Yeah, yeah, it does. And when you are intentional about, okay, this is, this is what I want to see happen. And this is the seed that I'm going to plant. And it really is about planting it in faith and then continuing to water it, not planting it in faith and keep digging it up. That's something somebody told me last week. And I was like, you know what? You're right. You're right. All right. So when you plan it, you have to trust that it's there and that it's going to grow. And, you know, when I first just thinking about like where I started with the society and 
even the price point I started at. I wanted to do luxury, but I was like, maybe I should make it accessible because luxury is new to the black community and blah, blah, blah. Like talking myself out of creating this luxury experience. And I talked myself out of it in mm -hmm. 2019 when it started. And this year, um, the challenges that have come with this year have shown me that had you done it differently, then these challenges wouldn't be here. And one of my chapter presidents, DJ, she really, look, it's funny, God will always send the right people at the right time to say the right thing. And she was just kind of like, you know, no, our community needs luxury. We haven't had access to it. It hasn't been created for us. And the fact that you have even stepped out to start this, let alone now you're rebranding to do a whole new launch in a matter of months, this is needed. So the fear is going to be there, but mm -hmm. don't be afraid to charge what you're worth and charge what we are worth. Because at the end of the day, you're raising and setting a standard for black women. Yeah. And that is just like, man, you're right. Like I have to get out of my own way because I'm not just doing this. I'm not doing it for me. I'm yeah. doing it for everybody else. And so a lot of times, you know, we, we plant those seeds and you can't plant them in fear. You've got to plant them in faith. And you just have to know that it's going to work out. Yeah. And I think that at the root of that, we go back to con confidence, right? This is confidence conversations. And that's yeah. a huge yeah. part of it. It's we talk ourselves out of it because we're not seeing results right away or because of the reality of what we've seen, right? The history and like what we're looking at around us. And that's especially difficult to maintain a sense of confidence when what you're doing is such a novel idea that you're not going to have anything like any other measure stick to like compare it to like you are the benchmark. And I think yeah. that that's one of the most intimidating things is being like, I've never seen this done before. Like how, how is this going to happen? How do I make it through? Because it's something that is brand spanking new. So I want to get your tips on how you remain confident and really like how you're mindful of that in every single day. Mm. That's a good question. So first things first, I definitely surround myself with people who have the same mindset as me. Um, like I, <laughs> and people who are on the same journey as me, as far as like being driven to be the absolute best that they can be um, because they lift you up, right? So having somebody in your corner that is going to be able to lift you up and keep you lifted. Um, my best friend and I actually, I started the big leap for her. She's finished the book and <laughs> she just like has been really encouraging. For example, over the last couple of weeks, as we've been reading it, like, you know, your genius zone strategy is your thing. You need to do this. And so Having people around you is a major key. Um, I would say also in staying confident, um, doing the, being intentional about the things that make you feel confident. I have never had body image issues, I would say, um, but I know that I feel better when I am at a certain weight. So it's not about being skinny, it's about being healthy and making sure I'm doing what I need to do to take care of my body, right? Um, and I am most confident when it's 8 a.m. I'm a morning person. So I'm not somebody who wants to be speaking at an event at three o'clock. I'm tired at three. So knowing you're where you are at your best also will help you feel confident and doing what you need to do. Some people might be like, oh my gosh, you take naps sometimes. Yes, sometimes I need a nap. I go live on Wednesdays at 8.30. That requires a nap in the middle of the afternoon uninterrupted so that at 8.30, I can pop back up and be my best. So really in order to, I would say, feel your best and really being able to operate from your most confident space is doing the things that you need and having the people around you so that you can show up confidently whenever you need to. Yeah, and I think confidence, or sorry, confidence is key. Yes, that's true. But I think community is key. Mm -hmm. And the people, like, I love what you say about making sure that the people that you surround yourself with are going on the same journey. And it's not that your tracks look the same or you're in the same profession or even doing anything that's similar, but it's about mindset. Like, it do is. these people, one, support me or have positive things to say? Because I, support isn't, you know, someone is, yes, that's great, Shayla. This looks good. There, there are people who can give you con constructive criticism, but at the end of the day, have your best interest at heart. 
too. Are they people who are positive in their own lives? Like it's not just about like supporting you and lifting you up, but do they really believe what they're doing? And do they practice what they preach? Because yeah. you want to surround yourselves with people who are also on the same track, on the same journey, people who show up and just say that and then go back and live a different life you know, it, it's hypocritical, but not just that. I think that's where we allow judgment to kind of seep in, but where we're, you know, living authentically and are able to truly kind of be on this track, we can say, oh girl, I messed up yesterday and have a dialogue about that and then get what we need to set ourselves back on the right track. And you can only get that if you have people who are really being intentional about being on that journey too. And it's not about being perfect because no one is like we mess up, but yeah. having a space where you can come to a friend and say, hey, I messed up, I need help. Or, hey, can you you assist me with X, Y, and Z and having a safe space? Because I think that one of the hardest things for not just entrepreneurs um, or people who are looking to find more success in their careers, but just people in general, is this whole thing of suffering in silence mm. in whatever area that it is because we think that we're going through this thing alone no one else understands the pain that I feel and usually it's because there's not a safe space to talk about what it is that you're going through to talk about what what it is that you feel so you you keep yourself in that state of silence and you you don't express either your need for help or just getting it out like having a good cry and a one shoulder thing, I was gonna say one thing my therapist uh has told me before, long before I quit my job she said that as you transition into being this woman CEO it is your responsibility to be mindful of what you need and sharing that with the people in your life because mm -hmm. a lot of times we feel alone because we are the ones making ourselves be alone yeah. right I don't have to be alone in this entrepreneur journey even if like you know my husband he may not have ever run a company um, he may not have ever started a business, so he may not always be able to understand the level of stress I'm under, but it's up to me to be able to share that and share that journey and say, babe, today was a rough day. Like, this is what happened. I'm pissed. Like, it, it's yeah. my responsibility to make sure he hears it, because even if he doesn't understand it, he knows what it means to be angry. He knows what it means to be frustrated. He knows what it means to be upset about something that happened at work, right? We've all been there. And even though the magnitude is much greater as an entrepreneur, if you want that circle, it's up to you to, I was going to say cultivate, but that, I don't think that's the word I want to use, but it's up to you to foster those relationships so that you can cultivate that circle. Yeah. And so that that's key. And it's really an important point, but I want to know what advice you may have for introverts who yeah. want to cultivate that circle, but are maybe a little intimidated by like reaching out to people or really just putting themselves out there. How do you cultivate the circle that is going to ultimately be your support group? Um, so surprisingly enough, whenever I took the Myers-Briggs test, I'm actually more introvert than I am extrovert, which always surprises people. Um, but I have a hard time in crowds. Like I'm not the person that's like going to be going to meet new people. If you ever see me in public, please come speak. I am friendly. I'm just not extroverted. <laughs> right. I'm um, nice, I promise. Look, I'm like, I'm really nice. I'm just not going to come and speak to you. <laughs> but um, for all of my introverts out there, I would say um, sometimes in coaching programs or in settings where you can meet other entrepreneurs, it's helpful to be open to meeting new people. I will say I have a girlfriend who is in the wine industry and she actually is extremely extroverted <laughs> and she was like, she reached out to be my friend and I was just like, oh, okay. And I didn't know, <laughs> I don't reach out to be people's friend. I was just like, oh, but being open allowed me to really develop a great friendship with her and I, you know, love her to death. And then I would say sometimes you have like those people around you who are going to be able to be there and support you, even if not by direct experience. Um, it may be through something else, right? Like one of my good friends, her parents were business owners. She's not, but she does know it firsthand because she was the child of business owners. So sometimes it is about like 
really just being okay with sharing where you are. Sometimes there's people already in your life that can be that support for you, but you have to give them a chance. Yeah. Giving them a chance is key. And I, I love that you have opened yourself up just to meeting new people. It's crucial in entrepreneurship, but also just to have a good time to meet new yeah. people, to make friends. I put myself in the room with people so that I have the opportunity to expand my circle. So mm. traffic sales and profit, I'm gonna plug it. No, this is not paid, but let me tell you, it's the best conference that any black entrepreneur could ever go to. I went to the first one in 2019, June, 2019. And the TSP conference is for black business owners, and entrepreneurs. And you walk into that room, there's hundreds of black successful business owners, seven, eight figure earning business owners. And it's amazing. And it's people that you'll be like, I've never heard of them. They do what now? And it's a million dollar and, and them too. And them too. Like I'm talking about million dollar photography businesses, million dollar insurance agencies, million dollar jewelry companies, hair companies, and being in that room and rubbing elbows, right? Issa Rae always talks about networking across right? So I may not be at that seven figure market, um, but there are people beside me who are going to get there eventually too. And so really being okay with sitting at the table and being open, because I told you, I'm not going to go out of my way. But when people come up to me and they're like, hey, aren't you the Black Girls Wine founder? I'm like, yes, hi, how are you? <laughs> From my chair that I've been sitting in all weekend. <laughs> but sometimes it is about being in the room. And the opportunities and the people will find you. They will, I promise. So I would say definitely get out of, well, post-COVID, because we've all been stuck. But <laughs> oh, get out of the house if you can. If you can't make it um, in person, of course, virtually. I know TSP is still happening virtually. There's a lot of conferences happening virtually. And with as progressive as software has become, um, now you can really network at stuff like that. And yeah. It's a lot less intimidating to me online from the comfort of my own home. So I actually have really enjoyed this networking virtually. Um, but get yourself in the room because that always helps. Yeah. I mean, you can't have a seat at the table if you don't at least get into the room. So yeah. you can't. You absolutely uh -huh. cannot. That's good. Look, that's a word. Uh -huh. I like that. that is <laughs> you can't have a seat at the you table. Can end on that's quotable. No, but um, <laughs> where do people find you? I want to know your social media, websites. How do we get in touch with Shayla? How do we get in touch with Black Girls Wine to join the membership? Tell yeah. us everything. Yeah, so you can follow me. I'm, Instagram is my favorite home uh, and Twitter. <laughs> I'm yeah. Shayla Renato at Shayla Renato and then at Black Girls Wine. Um, and if you want to follow the society, it's at Black Girls Wine Society. So lots of fun happening there. You get to see what we're up to. Um, Black Girls Wine is like a little bit of my personal wine journey and just the brand itself. And then Shayla Renato, um, helping business owners build profitable businesses on and offline. So come hang with me. Yes, I love it. Please go hang out with Shayla. Join the luxury experience that is Black Girls Wine. And of course, cultivate your confidence daily. Shayla, I'm so happy that you were here to join us. Thank you for having me. This has been such a great conversation. It's been an honor.